Okay, are you having fun yet? So, let me start this way. Look at this formula. I mean, isn't it just obvious what makes a quality teacher? <laughs> Certainly, some in Houston and New Mexico and other places where VAM has taken hold think it's obvious. I'm sorry. It's not obvious to you? OK, let me try to make it clearer. You get my point. While this may be a good data point, it fundamentally misses the point. Does it tell you how your kids are doing? No. How you're doing? No. How you need to grow as a professional? No. Does it tell you anything about what your kids need? No. So think about it. When the data we get from standardized tests aren't available to teachers until after the school year is over, and testing companies like Pearson won't disclose the test questions anyway, then what do these tests do to help us address student needs? I love this today. Sadly, we know what they really do. The tests take away time from enriching and joyful learning, and they cause a lot of stress. And I just heard somebody talk about money. And what about all the other negative effects you know so well after teaching through more than a decade of high stakes testing? Worse, it's not like this testing fixation lived up to the promises made when No Child Left Behind was passed. But don't blame the statisticians for this formula. It was the privatizers the polarizers, the austerity mongers, the deprofessionalizers, and even some public officials who will remain nameless for a minute. <laughs> I'm sure we could put several others up there. But they pushed a false narrative. A narrative that said you can improve education by starving public schools, criticizing them relentlessly, peddling private alternatives, then demonizing those who do the work and marginalizing those who fight back. As if that wasn't enough, they're using the courts too. First, as we talked about at the last convention, trying to eliminate over a century of educators' basic due process rights and now this summer, they've gone to the Supreme Court trying to eliminate 40 years of legal precedent that grants teachers the right to organize and bargain. Perhaps even more pernicious is the myth they tell that effectively takes everyone but the individual teacher off the hook for student success. They say, there's a perfect straight line correlation between the effort of one teacher and the success of all of her students. Success that they measure each year only by one standardized test score in reading and one standardized test score in math. Remember that horrible movie, Waiting for Superman? Here's a clip. It should be simple. A teacher in a schoolhouse, filling her students with knowledge, and sending them on their way. We know much more goes into teaching, <laughs> and much more has an impact on student success, poverty, segregation, addiction, violence, the challenges that our students and their families face. And it's not just the hard stuff. Social mobility, education, healthcare, nutrition, 
early childhood education, diversity, time to play. All these factors have impact. That's why even the economists tell us that teachers account for 10% of the variance in student achievement, 10%. But that's, of course, if you define student achievement by test scores. Don't get me wrong. Of course, teachers matter. None of us would be doing what we're doing if that wasn't the case. And there wouldn't be education, much less public education, if teachers didn't matter. I became a teacher because of the teachers who inspired me, starting with my mom. Growing up, I loved visiting her classroom and watching her teach. And over the years, even people in this room have come up to me and said, it makes me feel a lot older when they do, <laughs> your mom was a great teacher, and I couldn't be prouder. And I love teaching at Clara Barton High School in Crown Heights. I don't know about you, but I was scared to death my first day teaching. But I kept hearing my mom's words. Randy, this is the most important work you can do. Be real, be prepared, and prepare the next generation. And she'd say it pretty much just like that. I love my students, all of them. Those who were angels and those who made me earn their respect. <laughs> Failure wasn't an option for them or for me. And yet in my government classes, how many times did I hear, I can't freaking do this. I have no idea what this Constitution is, much less what this amendment is about. And then, like all of you, I started drawing them out and engaging them. I saw them start to care, even as they resisted my pushing and prodding. I saw them embrace learning. And when they started getting so into it, they wanted to show everybody what they knew. And I was so proud of them when they went on to win a statewide debate competition on the Bill of Rights. Now, every one of you has a story like this, and you're going to tell those four reporters, right? Yeah. Every one of you. Teaching is our heart. Our students are our soul. That's why we set our alarm clock for 4 AM or even earlier in the morning to finish touches on our lesson plans or take hundreds of dollars out of our pockets to buy classroom supplies or toss and turn, unable to sleep as we worry about a student who's struggling. Teachers, AFT members, do what it takes to support our students. But instead of offering educators support, the prevalent attitude for far too long, based upon that myth of the straight line, has been to scare and to sanction. Now, I'll give the reformers credit. It's gotten results, but not the results we should ever want. Look. Look at some of the responses to that survey that we collaborated on with the badass teachers. Enthusiasm for the profession down by nearly half. Almost 80% of those who responded said they feel disrespected by elected officials. And the biggest everyday stressors, mandated curriculum, large class sizes, standardized tests, and adoption of new initiatives without proper training or professional development. <laughs> Worn down and fed up. But there's another response from that survey that's equally powerful. More than 85% want to stay in this profession and fight to make it better. 
fight for a different way. And we know there's another better way, a way that has always been our way, to treat teachers as professionals. From those who founded this union 100 years ago to those who lead it today, professionalism has always been our way. Do you have those pictures up? Good. We are a union of professionals. Al Shanker once said, the very nature of professionalism is to have expertise in a given field and to have the power to exercise judgment. But we can go back further to Webster's. And I quote, let me find it, professionalism, the skill, good judgment, and polite behavior, sorry, I'm still working on that one, <laughs> that is expected from a person who is trained to do a job well. You get my point. Professionalism is making the decision you need more than 15 minutes to teach fractions, and you have the latitude to do so. Or taking the time to talk to your students about what recently happened in Charleston instead of doing test prep or even teaching your scheduled lesson on the Vietnam War. <laughs> Professionals are well trained. They maintain deep knowledge. They set the standards for their profession. They work together to meet them. They share. They're paid fairly. And they speak up together about the needs and aspirations of the profession and the needs and aspirations of the people they serve. Let's be frank. In our line of work, no one is given us the tools and conditions we need without a fight. And no one is handing us professionalism without a fight. And that's why, brothers and sisters, we need voice. Yes. Our individual voices, yes, excuse me. When you have knowledge and skills, as you do, Voice empowers you to apply that knowledge and skill with the autonomy and respect you deserve, respect you have earned. But even more important is our collective voice. Because collective voice is our power. It's the way we make our neighborhood schools, places where parents want to send their kids, places where kids are engaged and where educators want to work. Of course, it's important to get policy right on paper, and we work really hard on that, devoting blood, sweat, and tears to bargain good contracts and lobby for good district, state, and federal policy. And in an economic era of austerity and a political environment of divide and conquer, it takes a whole heck of a lot just to hold on to what we have. But professional voice, Collective voice is about demanding what our students, our communities, and we deserve. I'm talking about voice in our contracts, voice in our schools, voice in our communities, voice in the state houses, and voice on Capitol Hill. All that power in all those places might seem like a big ask. But we don't have to look to the heavens and simply pray as important as that might be to me and others, to achieve voice in those places. We just have to look around and build on what's already happening. Take our contracts. Among other things, they give voice to educators to contest factory-like schooling. Look no further than New York's prose schools. I cannot actually say it. But you can read it, Progressive Redesign Opportunity School for Excellence. Say that five times fast. They have voice newly envisioned, housed right within the teacher's contract. These schools provide flexibility and foster collaboration. Educators have used their collective voice 
to make decisions they believe work better for their students. Team teaching in classrooms, seminar style classes that reflect what students will see in college. Teachers teaching the same students for consecutive years so that they get to know their students even better. Pros may be the best kept secret in American education, but not for long. This year, there were 62 pro schools in New York City. Next year, there will be 126. And while charters may get a lot of ink, next year there will be about as many pro schools as there are charters in New York. But unlike most charters, the pro schools are sharing their best practices so all schools can grow and improve, not fight and compete. And speaking of charters, charter educators want a voice too. Look at how the teachers at Ben Franklin in New Orleans have achieved it. From the day it opened in 1957, Ben Franklin was a high-performing public school, producing surgeons and state legislators, attorneys and artists, including a trumpeter by the name of Wynton Marsalis. And it's located, for those of you who don't know New Orleans, on the shores of Lake Pontchartrain. You know the rest of the story, though. The waters rose. 7,000 teachers were fired, termination notices arriving where houses once stood. But instead of cauterizing the city's education wound, education reformers seized on the trauma to charterize it. After the flood, Ben Franklin's struggle to reopen became national news, but something didn't return. The union, educators' collective voice, and it took a while, but folks began to realize that in many ways, teachers having a voice was part of what made Franklin, Franklin. And so last fall, nearly a decade after Hurricane Katrina, the teachers at Ben Franklin collectively bargained the first charter school contract in the history of Louisiana. And that contract, that contract says new teachers will get extra coaching and feedback. They'll have committees that will meet monthly to address school leadership and labor management. They'll have real planning time, a period every day. Every staff member gets a desk and a lockable storage cabinet. <laughs> Very important. And they'll get 80% of the premium covered for medical, dental, and vision. That is the power of collective voice. But it's not just New York, and it's not just New Orleans. Look what happened in Los Angeles this year. A new contract was won, fueled by the activism of our members and the support of the community. After years of growing classes, we won caps on class size. After an evaluation system was imposed on us, we want a process to create a new system with our input. And after eight years of flat salaries, we won raises. So let's be clear. And I really hope the press quotes this. America's educators deserve a raise, a real raise. It's not right when CEO pay skyrockets while teacher pay remains stagnant. And it's really not right when 25 hedge fund managers make more than every single kindergarten teacher in the United States combined. Fair pay, that's something that unions have gotten pretty good at fighting for. It's no coincidence that when unions were at our strongest, 
the middle class was at its height. Look at that chart. Today, even with the sharp decline in union density, union members make almost 30% more than non-union workers. And when workers get a raise, quality goes up too. The Scott Walkers, the Koch brothers, the hedge funders, the backers of the Friedrichs case, they all want to preserve today's status quo, a rigged, trickle-down economic system. And to do it, they need to eviscerate unions, not undermine us, but eviscerate us. Why? Because we get in their way. Because unions give working people power at the bargaining table and at the ballot box. Look what happened in Philly. Our members hit the streets to say enough. Enough of the billionaires and the unelected school reform commission demonizing teachers, cutting guidance counselors and school nurses, and closing neighborhood schools. Sound a little familiar? And so with our members and our allies, and yes, our funds, we helped win the nominations of Jim Kenney for mayor and Helen Gim for city council and sent a powerful message that the future of Philadelphia schools should be in the hands of the people who live in the city of brotherly love. In community after community, the tide is turning. Now, let me say it a different way. Not that I'm really a grammar teacher, but the tide is turning uses the passive voice. Let's use the active voice. We are turning the tide. <laughs> Michael was right when he spoke before. You know this and I know this. And it extends beyond our neighborhoods, our cities, and our counties. It extends to our state houses. Nowhere have we seen that more clearly than in Texas. Now, everything is bigger in Texas, even the bad ideas. <laughs> Earlier this year, in the dead of night, privatizers took a school turnaround bill and inserted the entire ALEC playbook, letting low-performing charters expand, outsourcing struggling schools, and stripping not just due process, but basic health and safety regulations. Well, the cover of darkness was not enough to hide this effort from the Texas AFT. They got out, got mobilized, got to Austin, and they got these amendments stripped from the bill. And that wasn't all. Some in the legislature wanted to expand privatized online learning despite its huge failings. We stopped it. Some wanted to create a voucher system. We stopped that too. And after we organized more Texas educators than ever before, they tried to make it impossible for educators to use payroll deduction to pay their union dues and they tried to keep school boards from working with our unions. And we stopped those bills, too. Bad bill after bad bill after bad bill met defeat after defeat after defeat. And in their place, we sent to the governor's desk bills that reduced time on testing, strengthened transparency for test developers, and ended mandatory teach, teacher firing at low-performing schools. That's collective action. You get in my drift? That's collective voice. But this year, we lost Linda Bridges, the president of the Texas AFT. She laid the groundwork for these victories and would have been so proud of us and of Texas AFT.
And just yesterday, we lost another one of our heroes, Tim Murphy, our former local president from Hartford, Connecticut. Where's Connecticut in the house today? For all those we have lost, may their memories be for a blessing. So we're making our voices heard in lots of different ways. But we also make it heard in the way policy gets made. And that's the philosophy behind the AFT Teacher Leaders Program. The AFT started this program three years ago to tap into what we knew existed within teachers, empowering them to seize their leadership potential, to bust down the doors that are too often shut on them, and to play the leadership roles outside classrooms, evaluating and shaping national and local policies that govern our schools. We started with five locals. Fifteen have now participated, and we keep adding more. What did we do? We put in place a structure a network and trainings, eight Saturdays a year. And now our teacher leaders are advancing our profession and transforming our schools. Take Afra Khan and Lily Holland, two of our teacher leaders from Boston. When their district reworked how they counted the number of students in poverty, whole neighborhoods were dropped from the free lunch program that is a literal lifeline for so many children. So Afra and Lily, after digging into the research, tried to discover how the student poverty rate went from 92% to 68% overnight. They are determined to get their students the services they need. Thank you very much. <laughs> or listen to Alicia Hunter, an AFT teacher leader from Washington, DC. This program has really helped me realize that I am not just a role model for my students, but also I'm a model in the community. And so a teacher isn't just about the content, but more so a representative of the community and more so of social change. And so I realize now that I'm just not a classroom teacher anymore, but instead an advocate um, for education, for fairness, and for what's just right. Thank you, Alicia. Education policy has been dictated us, to us for far too long. We are the experts. You are the front lines. It should be determined with us. That's what we've been doing in Washington right now in the fighting for the an overhaul of No Child Left Behind and Race to the Top. Since January of this year, nearly 100,000 AFT members have spoken up along with business leaders, community partners, and parents. We've lobbied hard that schools should be places of learning and joy, not stressing and testing. We've asked Congress to give teachers and paraprofessionals the latitude, the supports, and the resources necessary for them to do their jobs well. What a concept. Then in April, in this Senate, something unheard of happened. A unanimous vote, a bipartisan vote in committee to overhaul No Child Left Behind. <laughs> this new bill maintains the original intent of the ESEA Act, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, to address poverty and educational inequality with targeted funding for poor kids. But it also resets accountability measures to focus on teaching and learning and not high stakes testing. It gets away from the counterproductive focus on scores, on sanctions, and on school closings. And it stops the Department of Education from federalizing teacher evaluations, essentially from being the human resource office in every school district in America. Now, while the Senate is debating this bill as we speak, last week, 
The House pushed through a divisive and partisan bill that takes money out of communities and away from the kids who need it most. Yes, that bill too took on high stakes, but it rolled back any requirements that states and districts help struggling schools and students. So look, as every civics teacher and every activist in this hall knows, the Senate committee vote is not enough. We need the current Senate bill to pass. And we need that bill to be the basis for a conference and the bill the president signs. We need this reset, and we're going to keep the pressure on until we get the overhaul of NCLB. That's what we can do with collective voice. In our contracts, in our schools, in our communities, in our state houses, and on Capitol Hill. So am I forgetting one? OK, the White House. Our voice will help determine who becomes the next president of the United States of America. Now, our endorsement is decided in two phases. For the primaries, the AFT Executive Council, who are elected by the convention, makes endorsement recommendations. For the general election, our convention chooses our candidate. That's why, in advance of the primaries, we held town halls with our members, elicited impact and input on our You Decide website, conducted polls to assess member sentiment, and invited every declared candidate to be interviewed by our executive council. None of the Republican contenders, <laughs> and the list seems to grow every day, even responded to the invitation. Now, that's not respect. These candidates are free to disagree with us, but rather than state their case and hear our side, they opted to ignore us. Apparently, Wall Street billionaires are worthy of their time, but not hardworking educators that mold the next generation. But there are candidates who respect the vital work we do. Senator Sanders, <laughs> Governor O'Malley, and Hillary Clinton joined us for what were essentially group job interviews. Your vice presidents asked them questions, as did our rank and file members. The candidates didn't flinch, nor did they flounder. And each of them are great people. And each said, in no uncertain terms, that elected leaders must respect educators and must work with their unions. One said, and I quote, it's just dead wrong to make teachers the scapegoats for all of society's problems. Where I come from, teachers are the solution, and I strongly believe that unions are part of the solution, too. That was Hillary Clinton. Now. She stood above in vision, in experience, and in leadership. And when we polled our members who can vote in Democratic primaries, they told us two things. 79% said we should endorse. And by a three to one margin, our members said, we want Hillary. And so. That's why on Saturday, our executive council overwhelmingly voted to endorse Hillary Rodham Clinton for President of the United States of America. Now, I'm not saying that voice trumps everything else. We need good policy. We need good contracts. 
But voice breathes life into all our other efforts. We fought for language and contracts that covers everything from class size to peer assistance programs to making sure when a teacher is sick, a substitute is called, and those students aren't just dumped into the class of the person who's least likely to say no to the principal. <laughs> We've even negotiated time for bathroom breaks. But a contract is a piece of paper. And those of you from the UFT may remember what I'm about to do. This is a contract, 58 years old, I need my glasses to read. This is a contract I had the honor of negotiating. I used to call it the little white book. So take Article 21, Section A, Part 6, for those of you who don't have it memorized, <laughs> it says, the following issues shall not be the basis for discipline of pedagogues, the format of bulletin boards, the arrangement of classroom furniture, and the exact duration of lesson units. I love that book. Okay, contract. I do not want my principal telling me I have to use orange in the backdrop of my bulletin board instead of blue. You know I am partial to blue. I want to use blue for the backdrop. So I need you to go in and tell him <laughs> right now that I want a blue backdrop on my bulletin board. Come on, now. Okay, and also do me a favor. If he says no, could you go to the superintendent and tell him to tell the principal not to do this to me? OK, I think you all got my point, right? <laughs> yes, did you get my point? <laughs> Look, <laughs> a contract lays out our hard-won, hard-earned rights. But unless we stand up and infuse it with voice, it's just a little white or blue or red or green book. Voice breathes life into our efforts. Sometimes educators have to file grievances when principals cross the line. Sometimes you have to argue at a labor management meeting for less paperwork or more time to implement a new curriculum. Sometimes you got to force the superintendent to hear you out on how your PD feels like detention. Your students who are English language learners need better resources. Sometimes you have to ask the local NAACP or the church or the synagogue or the mosque to stand with you as you advocate for wraparound services or for art or music or physical education. Sometimes you have to knock on doors and make phone calls so that we elect policymakers who are going to work with us or demonstrate and lobby those very same policymakers so that they remember they are elected by the people and working for the people. It's our voices, our shared voices, our combined involvement that brings the contract to life that secures policy that helps and not hinders teaching and learning. And for those of you who are saying, I'm not in a collective bargaining state, even if you live in a state without collective bargaining, 
And we need a new president to change that so that all states have collective bargaining. But even right now, if you live in a state without collective bargaining, you can still leverage that voice with the district or school board. Just ask our members in Jefferson Parish, Louisiana, whose school board eliminated collective bargaining three years ago. Our members joined with community partners to elect a new school board, and now collective bargaining is again within reach. This, brothers and sisters, this is all possible, but only when we speak up together. When we unite, when we unite our voices, we take back some control over our lives, and we make the lives of others, particularly our students, better. Being treated like a professional, paid like a professional, respected like a professional, with the ability to collaborate with other professionals, with collected voice, this is all possible. <laughs> Through the union, the engagement of one becomes the power of many. So this, our 100th year, the AFT has set an ambitious goal to have 1.6 million conversations, a conversation with every member of our union to engage, to empower, to make all of our voices heard, and to have each other's back. In the words of the great civil rights and labor leader, A. Philip Randolph. At the banquet table of nature, there are no reserved seats. You get what you can take and you keep what you can get. If you can't take anything, you won't get anything. And if you can't hold anything, you won't keep anything. And you can't take anything without organization. I showed you earlier. Well, teachers are not algorithms, and students are not test scores. And frankly, there's no formula except one. Our voices combined equal power. The power to improve our schools, the power to improve our communities, and the power to improve our nation. The power to act and act collectively. And you don't need to memorize or decipher that one. Just look under your seats and wear it proudly. Yes, and they are all larges right now. So either swap with your neighbor or outside we can swap some t-shirts. So, you ready? It's time for us to take back our profession. It's time for us to hold our elected leaders to a higher standard. It's time to reclaim the promise of public education and indeed the promise of America. Because if we don't do it, no one else will. So you ready now? So when public education is demonized and denigrated, raise your voice. When corporate-backed politicians starve our schools and sell them off, raise your voice. When they 
try to pin the blame on teachers, raise your voice. When our students don't get the supports they need or leave college saddled with debt, raise your voice. When racism rears its ugly head and nine churchgoers are gunned down in Charleston, raise your voice. When growing income inequality and wage stagnation threaten the ability of people to climb the ladder of opportunity, raise your voice. Brothers and sisters, we must raise our voices for our kids, for our families, for our communities. Collective voice is power. So let's get out there and raise our voices and raise hell. Thank you very much.